Good evening. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I invite you to join us. United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. We just had uh, three new police officers uh, join the force today and the honor guard put the flags up tonight so they look pretty nice. A roll call please. Gary. Here. Grinberg. Here. Pepcorn. Here. Strand. Here. Mahoney. Here. You might notice that the light panels in our chamber tonight are light blue. They will remain lit in this specific color for all public meetings throughout the month of September as we participate in the Prostate Cancers Foundation Light It Blue campaign. One in nine men will be affected by prostate cancer, but the disease remains nearly 100% treatable if caught early. So I encourage people to get it checked. Health. The Environmental Health Division has been assisting Kate, Kate Holton with the organization of a memorial event for her former fiance, Jay Hollywood Halverson. He was one of our food vendors, and we will have an event to include food vendors, which will be held at the Fargo Cass Public Health parking lot on Tuesday, September 17th. The public is invited to help remember Jay in healing with food. I know Commissioner Strand, you've met him and knew he's a great guy, so we're very happy to do that. With the first report of North Dakota of severe respiratory illness related uh, to vaping, Fargo Cass Public Health cautions the community that the long-term health impacts of vaping is unknown and discourages everybody from using vaping or e-cigarette products of any kind. Fargo Cass Public Health offers free nicotine dependent counseling to assist anybody interested in quitting tobacco, including vaping products. And I think that it's still out there, evidence says uh, not all in yet, but some people are very concerned about the side effects of vaping right now. Solid Waste and Recycling Department recently partnered with Minkota Recycling to offer cardboard recycling containers for move-in weekend at NDSU. The goal was to collect 14,000 pounds of cardboard, but during the three-day three period, they collected nearly 16,000 pounds of cardboard. A lot of cardboard for people moving in. Forestry and Street Department and contracted staff have picked up more than 20, 21,000 piles of brush following the late June storm. Throughout July and August, forestry staff completed the post-storm survey to identify additional trees in need of removal or pruning due to the damage caused by high winds. City and contract staff removed 184 boulevard trees as a result. The forestry staff also pruned hanging branches and storm damage from more than 600 trees. Labor Day storm again resulted in the street department assistant or crews in working extended hours to prune and remove damaged trees and collect curbside brush and for a lot of people that had power outages because of this last storm. But I want to uh, say congratulations to the team to get to it, and you put on extra team people I know been on it, and I'm really pleased that the public was pleased with that. Strategic planning. The Block 9 groundbreaking was a year ago on September 12th, Wednesday. The parking ramp has been open for more than a month, and the tower is already 15 stories high. This is great progress for downtown Fargo and it will be the second tallest building in the state of North Dakota, just under the height of the Capitol. So we're close, but not above it. This week, Police Chief Todd met with Sanford executives to talk about the approach to suicidal persons and police training for those situations. It was an opportunity to brainstorm situations about people that we bring in because of ideations and behavior that indicates to officers that this person is a risk to commit suicide. I think it was a great uh, effort by the police force to meet with them. Our police force has also worked with Grand Forks and Bismarck to talk about uh, street, uh, street gangs and uh, intelligent policing. And I think you've had some good conferences, Chief, on that as well. The Fargo Public Library has several events happening in the next couple of weeks apart from the 2019 One Book, One Community Reading Project, ranging from Captain Marvel film screaming and to talk to a North Dakota Air National Guard 119th Wing presentation and a screening of Silver Wings Flying Dreams, the complete story of women Air Force service pilots. We'd also like to take a moment to recognize a birthday. One of the commissioners here always remembers everybody's birthday to a, an embarrassing point. But Commissioner Strand, uh, who has pointed out whose birthday it is, is having a 25th birthday of his newspaper, the High Plains Reader. So congratulations, Commissioner Strand. Thank you very much. If you want to help him out, pick up a copy of it on your way somewhere downtown. 
Oh, Eric's got one for you. Uh, lastly, they keep trying to put this one up here anyway. The Communications and Public Affairs Department has prepared a video showcasing the work of our inspections department. And I think the commissioners and I have received recent emails from a variety of people about either inspecting something, taking care of parking, or doing some different things in their neighborhood. And I think, Bruce, you've put the number out, who to call and who to see for that. And your, your department has stepped it up and is doing a lot more enforcing. So please give us a call if there's a problem, but let's show you what they do. The inspection department has many functions at the city of Fargo. The three major ones are building inspections, rental inspection, and code enforcement inspection. Building inspections have been done for decades. What we do when a project comes into the city of Fargo is we do a plan review on a project, we write a permit, and then we do inspections on that permit. Some of the inspection types we do are building inspection, mechanical, plumbing, and electrical inspection. So everyone that lives in the city wants a safe place to live, they want a safe place to work, and they want a safe place to play. So building inspections as a whole is trying to safeguard that ideal. Giving them safe parks to play in, that have safe walkways, giving them safe buildings to interact in, that they can go into and they can feel safe and there's no injuries or loss of life or health. So basically at the conceptual phase, you would work with an architect or registered design professional to get a project concept designed and get it into a plan form. From there, you guys would submit the plans to a, the building department for review. So as a plan reviewer looks over a set of building plans, they're looking for some of the same stuff I'm looking at on a construction site as an inspector. So from there, once the construction process starts, you'd work with developing the land, starting with the footings, the foundation, surveying that would go into the building. The construction part would happen with the structure, framing, insulation, working with roof, siding, all the different components that go into creating the building. So one of the coolest, newest technologies that the city of Fargo has implemented is the new permit software program. It's called LAMA, which is short for land management. And with that, we're starting to streamline the inspection and permitting process. This would be totally usable by the public and by contractors to be able to access their project specifically. It replaced five programs within our department. So it does plan routing, building inspections, rental housing, complaints, and the field application for the field inspectors to log their inspections online. So in the old days, all of those programs were separate and none of them talked to one another, where with our new software, they're all together and I can get rental housing inspections at the same time as I can look at their building permit, at the same time as I can see what inspector was there and what they found. Short term, contractors, developers, engineers, architects can open up an account and they can see all of their projects in one click. Longer term, homeowners will be able to apply for permits online, simple permits like decks, siding, things that they would normally have to come downtown for. And think of yourself living out almost to Horace and driving downtown. Just going to be able to have a, a few clicks of a button, pay online. Somebody from our department will review it and let them know when their permit's ready. They'll be able to print everything from their home. For code enforcement, that's changed a bit now. We brought on a new code enforcement inspector in 2019. So we're looking at many different ways that this person can work with the community on his different duties. All departments really take some enforcement action for code enforcement and nuisance issues. Our inspector looks at things mostly like junk, vehicles, and dilapidated homes. There are others, but those are the three that come in the most often. There's many reasons to have a new code enforcement inspector. And one is really the safety and livability of a city. There's different ways to submit nuisance issues. Fargo One has an app that's interactive. You can take a picture, you can put it on the app, you can interact and provide an email address. You can also call it in right to the departments. You can call in our department. We will log the complaint. We will put, assign an inspector to it and they will either give you a call or go out and act on the complaint. The inspection department is continually looking at 
upgrading and looking for new technologies that we can improve our department. Very good. Is there a motion to approve the order of the agenda? So, so moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those say nay. Motion carried. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the August 26, 2019 regular meeting? Moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. And motion carried. Consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items 1 through 34? So moved. Second. Gary Grinberg. Any, any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Gary? Yes. Grinberg? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. We'll go to the regular agenda. Item 35, presentation of the FM Diversion Recreation Plan. Adam Altenberg from Metrocog. Mayor, Commissioners, thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Adam Alterberg, and I'm with the Fargo-Moorhead Metropolitan Council of the Governments. We're a regional transportation and planning agency. And one of the projects we are currently working on with the Diversion Authority is the Fargo-Moorhead Diversion Recreation Plan, basically looking at different recreational and non-recreational components that could be integrated into the diversion, as well as start to visualize some of the positive amenities that could be incorporated that could lead this to be a regional and or national attraction. Um, a couple of project goals that we have um, started to develop is the first one is basically that this would be a um, provide wide range year round recreation activities. So activities that people can enjoy in both summer and winter. Um, also going to be working with uh, um, the Army Corps of Engineers to as um, working with the guidelines that they've started to develop to restore native plant communities and create habitats along the diversion channel. A couple of other goals here that you can see um, looking to complement existing um, or existing planned land uses along the corridor, as well as complementing per the permanent flood protection of the, of the diversion. So we'll be looking at both active and passive uses. Um, so some of the active uses, again, looking at different trail types that, could, that people could enjoy in both summer and winter, as well as other sporting activities such as birding um, and other, other, other activities. Um, some passive uses that we're starting to look at, though, too, is uh, potentially community gardens or small egg operations, um, solar installations or pollinator habitats, as well as different um, educational um, or research opportunities that could be integrated. Uh, project approach, I'll uh, just touch on this briefly. Uh, we just started this project about two months ago, so we're really kind of in the data gathering right now. Um, the, the timeline for this project is we, we are looking to develop a plan by September of 2020. Um, a, major, a major component of this plan is going to be looking at different funding opportunities. Uh, this will include more traditional uh, funding, such as grants, but also looking at ways if there is potential activities um, that could pr uh, provide revenue um, that in integrate, integrated into the project. Um, another important component is going to be governance. Uh, basically, this is going to be looking at the ownership. Um, so who, who is going to be responsible for some of these amenities? Uh, uh, what we're starting to think about right now is if it's going to be uh, some sort of, um, it, basically, if it's going to be a continuation of the P3 process, the public-private partnership, that's going to be responsible for um, construction of the diversion and maintenance activities for the diversion corridor itself. Uh, whether it's going to be uh, a, 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 some sort of agreement between the cities and counties, uh, potentially with uh, different um, uh, recreational groups in the area that could provide minimum maintenance, act, um, um, maintenance act, uh, activities. Um, another idea that we started to look at is whether this is potentially a joint powers agreement between the different park districts in the area. Uh, th this is something that we are going to be looking at closely and hope to, hope to develop as part of the planning process. Uh, just touch briefly, so briefly on this. Um, as part of our public outreach activities, we've been we've been meeting with the different cities and counties, as as well as the park boards in the area, over the last couple um, last couple of weeks. 
Um, we've also started to um, hold a couple of pop-up meetings um, to talk about the project. We were at Streets Alive on August 25th, and we were just at Forest Bean Days this weekend, uh, September 7th. Uh, we have two more meetings here coming up. We'll be at West Fargo West Fest September 21st, as well as the Red River Market on September 28th. Um, we also have developed um, an online survey. It's basically a visual preference survey that people can, can take a look at and start to select what, what amenities they'd like to see incorporated in this project. Uh, that can be found on our website, uh, www.fmmetricog.org. Um, we are also looking to hold a two-day uh, workshop slash summit slash public input meeting October 1st and 2nd. We'll have more information on that here in the, in the, in the coming days and weeks. But basically, we're looking to hold stakeholder uh, meetings with uh, elected officials and other, um, and other stakeholders, um, as well as um, potentially looking to um, maybe have tours of different areas along the diversion corridor, so people may be bringing people out uh, to start to visualize what, what amenities could be incorporated, uh, as well as holding our first public input meeting uh, during that time. So that is a very brief update of what the, the project that we're working on. I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Commissioners, any questions? Thank you, nice job, appreciate it, Adam. We can go into public hearings, item 36. There's a continuation of a hearing right away vacation in the alley between lots A, B, C, and D, E, F, T, and U, a vacated uh, 10 foot alley just lots T and U. And I don't know if you always want to do both A and B as continuation. Is there a Se second? Second. Uh, roll call vote, please. Grinberg? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Strand? Yes. Gehrig? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Item C, zoning change from single dwelling residential to neighborhood office in lot 11, block one, Silly's addition, approval recommended by the Planning Commission on 8619, first reading of the rezoning. Donald Kress to explain. Good evening, commissioners. Donald Kress of the Department of Planning and Development. I'll be presenting the next two items. Uh, your packet includes a zone change ordinance prepared by the city attorney's office for each item. Pardon me, item 35C, as the mayor has stated, is a proposed zone change from SR2 to Neighborhood Office at 1604 52nd Avenue South. Just to locate this here for you, 52nd Avenue, University Drive, Sunset Garden Cemetery. This is a uh, electrical substation here. And then this is the subject property, which is currently used as a church. It was originally built as a single family residence. In uh, about 1998, it was converted to a, a religious institution. And then that was later sold to the current uh, religious institution operating it. Uh, the zoning here is, as we said, SR2, single dwelling residential. The substation is zoned general commercial, and the surrounding residences here are also zoned SR2. This is some uh, shots of the site here. Uh, there's a cul-de-sac. As you see, this is a cul-de-sac. It's reached by a separate road. 52nd Avenue is out, is out here. So this is the cul-de-sac, just looking at the parking lot with the church there. Here's a long shot showing the, the cul-de-sac and then the adjacent uh, substation. And then in this photograph, we're standing in the parking lot and you see here's 52nd Avenue, here's the frontage road that comes in here, accesses this property and then the neighboring property also has a driveway off that frontage road and this connects here. There's this island with the fire hydrant in the middle of it. So that's what the site looks like. Um, this, uh, we'd have to bring your attention to the fact here that uh, so at the Planning Commission or subsequent to the Planning Commission, uh, we did receive a formal petition for protest. Uh, this is a part of our Land Development Code, Section 200906, that allows residents to protest a zone change. 35% um, of the surrounding owners, as indicated in the map here, did protest the zone change. What this means to your commission is if your commission would wish to go forward with the um, recommendation to approve, it would require a supermajority. That is, four commissioners would have to vote in favor of it rather than just three, as would normally be the case. Um, going back to the proposed neighborhood office zoning here, um, that is uh, the current owners, again, um, are intending to sell the church, are intending to relocate their church, and the proposed this zoning would make the building more generally available <clears throat> than having just to sell it to another church. 
uh, one could probably convert it back into a single family residence, but you'd have an asphalt front yard, which might make it a little less attractive. And uh, churches are allowed by right in the residential zones. And uh, so that's how this came to be here. But again, the, uh, that would make it a little more saleable. And also it would provide a transition between the general commercial zoning of the substation here and the, uh, and the residential zoning. And the applicant's representative, I believe, might uh, talk a little bit more about some of the discussions they've had with interested buyers on this. Uh, again, there's the letters included uh, in your packet that uh, refer, we referred to here, the petition. And there's a signature page on there that has, I believe, 16 signatures related to that. Um, the applicant's representative, uh, Mr. Ronald Robson, as well as Father William Reddick from the church are with us this evening and may wish to address the commission. The Planning Commission's recommendation is stated on the screen and, and uh, stated in your staff report. And again, commissioners, if you wish to go forward with approval, four of you would have to vote in favor of it rather than just three. Uh, that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone president who wishes to speak to this, please? Well, I'm Ron Robson. I'm the treasurer of the church and uh, as well as a new council member. I'm here with uh, Father Reddig as well. And uh, yes, we've had the property for sale since last October. And since that time, our realtor has told us we've had approximately eight um, people looking at it. Uh, I think most of them were attorneys who would like to make it into a small office area. Um, it, it isn't very attractive as a residence due to the asphalt front lawn, and we've had people question the presence of the substation immediately adjacent to the property as well as. Um, and so we believe, yes, it will uh, allow us uh, an easier job to sell it and would not detract from the property value either. Um, we think it would improve the neighborhood traffic patterns as well as because uh, when we have services there, we have a number of cars out on that frontage road that were in the pictures there. And it basically blocks it off into a, a single lane and even almost less than a single lane during the winter time, uh, in particular this past winter. And, uh, I, you know, from the letter we received, we, and, and it was our understanding, that I think the neighbors are concerned about uh, a commercial operation going in there it would bring a lot of traffic in during the day. I don't, I think with the neighborhood, uh, we feel with the neighborhood office zoning that that would be an appropriate uh, use of the space and uh, would keep the traffic low and would all, uh, keep it uh, from having the blockage that happens on Sunday mornings typically. So. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions of the commissioners? Is there anybody else who wishes to speak to this zoning change? Close public hearing. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'd move um, the Planning Commission's recommendation, move for approval and, and put the faith in the process that it would be a, whoever the buyer would be, would be a reasonable and would fit in well with the neighborhood. So. Chair, a second? Second. Further discussion? Commissioner Papcorn. Uh, Don, can you pull up the, just show the, the overhead of all the different properties that are there? Yes, sir. And I think, so basically, they're all residential. Yes, sir. That's all correct. the surrounding places. And uh, to me, it's all houses. And so I, I don't think it's appropriate. And the one thing they could do is remo remove the asphalt, and then you'd have a yard. So I, uh, I'm in favor of uh, having it go back to be, if you look at it, to me, it looks like a house. And so I, I think it would be much more with the character of the rest of the surrounding houses uh, if it was a house. That's my, that's my two cents. Thank you. Mr. Strand. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Don, I have a couple questions. Yes, sir. What, first of all, what's it take to become a church? How do you mean, sir? Well, anybody can become a church and become tax exempt. I, to my knowledge, it's pretty easy to become a church. Um, do, you know, do you know the history of how this went from being a house to a church? And I, well, it was converted, I believe it was a Latter-day Saints church originally in 1998. And then I believe that you would have bought it from, uh, perhaps Father Reddick knows the history of that. Please. Pardon me, sir, we'll have Father Reddick take it. Father William Reddick, uh, priest in charge at Holy Resurrection Orthodox Church. Uh, prior to it being Community of Christ, Latter-day Saints, as we understand, it was also a Mennonite community. We don't know the religious history prior to that. Uh, we purchased it, purchased it from Community of Christ, LDS, and we are a parish of the Orthodox Church in America. 
Uh, secondly, um, you said 16 protests, but I think I, there are 16 signatures on the letter. Sir. See, I see nine or 10 oh, protests. But I'm sorry. I don't know how you come up with a 35% oh, or not. Or okay. is it properties or is it owners? Right. Or? So I'll tell you what we have. What our ordinance provides. I might have had that number wrong, sir. Um, so the petition obviously signed by owners of 20% or more of the area. Of, this is from section 20906. The area of 20% or more of the area of the lots included in the area proposed to be zone changed, or in this case, the area adjacent extending 300 feet from the land area proposed to be changed, excluding the streets. So that's how we figure that. That's that same 300 foot range that we use for notification. And it's properties, not individual signatures. Yes, sir, that's correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Difficult problem with a place that's sitting there for so many years. Uh, Mayor, I just would. If I may just make one note, the uh, applicant has not really had a chance to m meet with any of the property owners. Um, I believe, uh, Mr. Robson, you said the folks were out of town here over time and hasn't really had a chance to follow up with any discussion with the property owners so far. So I don't know if you're commissioned. So they don't necessarily know that it may be used as law office or not a big commercial Yes, sir. Uh, the neighborhood office is intended for office, not for retail. OK. Roll call vote. Greenberg. Aye. Gary? Yes. Strand? Yes. Pepcorn? No. Mahoney? Yes. Thank you, Commissioners. Item D, you're up again. The Pines at the District uh, 3856 Avenue South, approval recommended by the Planning Commission 8619, growth plan amendment, zoning change of multiple resi dwelling residential to limited commercial and first reading of the rezoning. Again, Donald Crest to explain. Yes, sir. Thank you. So this location here uh, is out on uh, 56th Avenue South. Uh, here is uh, 52nd Avenue South, so we're going to go down the street and across the interstate from where we were a little bit ago. Uh, this is the Walmart here. Uh, this, many of these properties, these properties, as you may know, have been developed since this aerial photograph was taken. And so this property here is uh, in the Pines of the District Edition, and it is zoned MR3. And the applicant, who is the hospice of the Red River Valley, proposed to rezone it to LC, Limited Commercial, in order to establish a new hospice facility there. The hospice facility we consider a community service use and would fit technically in the MR3, but it would be more appropriate to have the limited commercial uh, zoning for something like this. Uh, this facility will include uh, some, some beds for uh, folks to stay in, so it's not just in-home hospice care. There would be, the, I believe, the first facility like this in North Dakota. The applicant will talk a little more about that. So again, the app project site is located at 3856 Avenue South. Uh, the zoning is MR3. This lap line was platted in 2013 and remains undeveloped. Uh, commissioners two, so there's the zoning here. Here's the MR3. This is single dwelling residential here. And this LC, this pink, is all limited commercial here. And there's some more multi-dwelling down here. These are under construction. You may have seen these townhomes under construction down there. Uh, commissioners two, uh, to make the zone change work, there also needs to be a change of the growth plan designation. The 2007 <coughs> growth plan as amended, tier one Southwest area plan, designates this for multi, uh, low to medium density, multi-dwelling residential. So in order to make this plan match the zone or the zone match the plan, uh, that designation would have to be changed to commercial. And so these two entitlements are running together here tonight. Your approval would approve both of them. Uh, the proposed transition or the proposed amendment will provide a transition area between the single dwelling housing to the west, which is here, and the uh, and the limited commercial to the east. The proposed low intensity community service use is compatible with the surrounding land uses and will accommodate a demand for out of home hospice care in the city. Here is a site plan that the applicant has provided. Uh, you're not voting to approve the site plan specifically. But this is the proposed layout again. Here's 38. The Walmart is up here. Here's that single dwelling housing. The, the site plan you're looking at here is actually flipped from the one that was presented at the Planning Commission. That is, earlier, the parking was on the west side and uh, the pond was over on the east. The applicant has reconsidered and reevaluated this and decided as uh, you know, it's more buffering against the residential or in relation to the residential. The, uh, the quieter usage to be over here, the parking more toward the street side. Uh, just uh, we got a couple. The, the, the subject property is a big open field, so the aerial photograph is a, probably an effective picture of that. But there's a fence right here. Uh, we've got a couple photos from that looking along this uh, the single 
dwelling residences and at the multi-dwelling down here. And we took these this morning. You can tell it was a rainy day this morning. Uh, so we're standing in that location. This is the single dwelling residential here. And then standing in that same place, there's that fence again. We're looking at, uh, at the multi-dwelling uh, to the south there. Um, the, uh, the applicant's representative is uh, Dan Boydy of the Boydy Law Firm and Tracy Capron, Director of Hospice of the Red River Valley. Uh, they also have a brief video they'd like to show the commission. I believe uh, they talked to one of the commissioners about this. Um, is that okay, sir? Uh, so uh, we thank Mr. Schilberger for uh, very quickly preparing the video for us this evening. Um, the video isn't very long, I take it? Uh, just a few minutes, sir. Home is where the heart is. And that's why it's our calling to fulfill the need to build the first hospice house in North Dakota. We invite you to be part of this gift to our community. The lives it will touch and the memories it creates will be immeasurable. The time is now. My name is Roger Greenley. I've had two experiences with Hospice of the Red River Valley. My mother uh, suffered from dementia and passed away. And a month later to the day, my daughter died from cancer. It would have been wonderful to have a hospice house uh, when my mother was in need of that and uh, my daughter, who were both uh, in the environment of a hospital where they couldn't recover from their diseases. In the final uh, week or two weeks, I didn't leave my daughter's side. Her husband was there. We stayed there. We slept there in the hospital room. A hospice house would be a better environment to make those uh, special times with family. Hospice is there to take care of the medical needs, and we want to be a family. My name is Brenda Geary, and my dad, Terry Burnett, received care under Hospice of the Red River Valley. Our journey started at the middle part of 2016, where he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And for 18 months, he fought the fight. Um, five brain surgeries, three of which were here local in Fargo, two of which were down at the U of M in the cities. As beautiful as hospitals can be, their main goal is to sustain life and, and to try to keep one going. But in the last weeks, I knew my dad wanted to pass and I knew that he was dying. And at that point, my only thought and the only goal I had in mind was how I could do that with providing the dignity and the compassion and the grace that was my dad and to preserve who he was. And through hospice's care, we were able to do that. We just simply wanted to bring him to more of a tranquil, peaceful place. And ultimately, he had always shared with me during those 18 months, if home was an option and if we could bring him there, he would love that. There are so many successful hospice houses around the country. This should be the exemplary model of care provided for end of life. I think there's a, a need, a great need, in this community right now to have some beds that can take care of it. I'm Irv Inniger, and I've been an avid supporter of Hospice of the Red River Valley. I had three parents die within a year all on hospice, but one went into one of these care units. Mm -hmm. My father-in-law went in because he was in a nursing home. His wife had Alzheimer's. He couldn't care for her anymore, but he also then couldn't care for himself. And hospice was there to put him in a bed where we knew family members could be around him to see the care and see the love that he had as he finished his last few days. My name is Kirsten Hopkins, and I'm a registered nurse with Hospice of the Red River Valley. I can think of many of my own patients who could have used a hospice house for reasons such as the home environment wasn't accommodating to their needs at end of life, or they didn't have a caregiver, or they had symptoms that needed the expert care to get them under control, and even when a caregiver needed respite. A hospice house would provide an environment that is designed around family and friends. We envision our hospice house as having an environment where patients feel it's their home away from home, where everyone can feel welcome and supported, and where children can feel comfortable. I think of spacious, wide open floor plans, large bedroom facilities that have couches that pull out for um, 
family members to be able to sleep right there um, in the same room. Bright colors that bring peace but bring happiness to a situation. It's quiet and peaceful, comfortable, just, it's a home. It is going to be a home for them. And not only for them, but their families as well. The people that come and see them. For years, Hospice of the Red River Valley has dreamed about having a hospice house in our community. I think it's time that we stepped up at North Dakota and we build our own facility, just like everybody else has done. We all at some point are going to lose a loved one, um, whether it be a parent, a child, a spouse. We need a hospice house to be able to be an option for families to be able to pass with the dignity that they deserve. And through your giving and your support, we can make this happen. And uh, commissioners, if I may note, since this is a growth plan amendment, we did have, uh, as required by our ordinance, a public meeting back on July 31st. We did get one neighbor from the uh, adjacent residences to uh, come and talk to us. He was just concerned, again, about the level of activity adjacent to the single dwelling residences. Um, we have not talked to him since that time, but I would think that this, he lives, uh, I believe he lived over, over here. Uh, and, but I believe that having, you know, putting the parking on the east side and then the, the fairly quiet pond on the west side would probably uh, alleviate his concerns for a lot of high traffic and high energy uh, activity near his property. Uh, so again, again, Mr. Boyde and Ms. Caprone are here and may wish to address the commission. Uh, the Planning Commission's recommendation is stated in your staff report and shown on the screen. That concludes staff's presentation, commissioners. Thank you. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to the commission? Mayor Mahoney and other commission members, uh, my name is Dan Boydy. I'm an attorney. I'm the attorney <laughs> with the Boydy Law Firm. Um, I'm honored tonight to uh, speak to you on behalf of this project. Also here uh, this evening are Chase, uh, Tracy Capron and Stephen Astrup from Hospice. And uh, just a little color. Uh, thank you for allowing us to share the video. But... Uh, Hospice has been searching for about two years to find a site. And we are the last state in the nation to have a hospice house. Um, the site selection has, has been driven by two primary criteria. One is, uh, and the utmost important, is the patient experience. And so a site that was large enough to um, create a serene environment for the patients was critical. Um, tied to that, this facility is expected to service potentially all of North Dakota and a good share of northwestern Minnesota. So finding a site that was accessible to the community uh, was also very important. So this, this site being close to the uh, <coughs> I-29 52nd interchange with some supportive services in the area, we think is uh, serving that, that site, collect, uh, site selection criteria. Uh, very well. So I'm available for any questions you would have. If you have technical questions or operational questions, Tracy or Steven are probably your better uh, options. Anything more on the uh, zoning, more technical side, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dan. You guys have been doing a good salt job tonight. But is there anybody else in the public who wants to speak to this? If not, we'll close the public hearing. I'd ask for a motion. So move. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Can I ask a question, Mr. Mayor? Pepcorn. So can you talk, so how does it go now, if you don't mind explaining? So since we don't have one, uh, as far as do, they, do you have to stay in the hospital or a nursing home, or can you talk a little bit about that? No. Um, a hospice house can be used for any patient in any care setting that gets into trouble, is what I call it. We actually have four levels of care in hospice, the main one being what we call general inpatient. Patient has things out of control, can't be managed at home, or they're discharged from a facility and it's still not right, they can come in and Medicare covers it at 100% of the cost. So it will be free to them as long as they meet criteria also. Um, it also allows our patients and families or anyone 
I call it a vacation, they get a five night, five day stay um, free with Medicare because being a caregiver is extremely difficult at times. So we can use that average length of stay is about five days is what Medicare looks like um, in a hospice house. So there is a churn. Our goal is to help the people and the residents of North Dakota not only have the optimal place if they pass or to go home. We want to help people be where they want to be and age in place. <coughs> That's our goal. Any other discussion? Well, I would just add, um, thank you for your indulgence, Commission. Um, when this video was played at the Planning Commission, pretty touching and I was you know for somebody who's experienced the hospice services with my family it, it um, you don't realize how important it is until you need it and I just think this is a great compliment to our community and the and the support of the board and the leadership of hospice to be you know having this discussion to move us forward so I appreciate your willingness to allow this to be played I thought it was appropriate it's a valuable service any other comments roll call vote please strand yes Grinberg aye Gary? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Item E, appeal of the Planning Commission decision on H619 to approve conditional use permits which allow a bed and breakfast in a single dwelling residential zoning district on lots two and three, block five, uh, Chase Roberts edition, uh, 611 8th Street South. Nicole Cutchfield to explain. Good evening, uh, Commissioners and Mayor. Um, yeah, so we're in front of you tonight because uh, normally we wouldn't see conditional use permits at the City Commission, but um, the final decision is at the Planning Commission. But we did receive an appeal. Uh, the Planning Commission did uh, approve this five to three. And a little bit of background, this is a property on 8th Street, you're probably well aware of it, um, owned by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Nelson on 611 8th Street South. Uh, they had filed an application to hold a bed and breakfast um, business at this location. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Um, it's located on a pri primarily a residential neighborhood, as you um, know, and as you see from the um, letters in opposition, uh, zoned SR3. And what that allows us to do is in SR3 is look at conditional uses. The, uh, Land Development Code provides the provision under 20 section 0402, 20-0402, uh, item S, um, criteria to have a bed and breakfast. So the Land Development Code did see situations where, you know, when a bed and breakfast, as we've seen them in other parts of the country, there's been a few here and there in Fargo. And there's a list of uh, possibilities under S, uh, 11 possibilities of uh, and code requirements that you must do. And one of the contentious components of this case is that it allows for um, item S5, receptions and private parties. Um, uh, similar activities shall not be permitted unless expressly approved as part of the conditional use permit. And so our planning commission testimony was a lot about the, um, the potential of parties as well as just the change of use to allow for the conditional use. And so this location here, just a zoomed in location, is, uh, includes um, at 611 a very large single family house. Um, the owners are here today um, to provide testimony and as well as a carriage house. And um, in context, uh, it, sh it doesn't really share a driveway, but it shares a buffer, if you will. And um, there's existing trees on the property to the, uh, immediately to the north that um, acts like a screening, if you will. And so going back to those conditions, if you're gonna have parking as related to the bed and breakfast, it requires um, screening. And so you'll see letters in your correspondence related to the screening as well. And so there has been dialogue between the property owners and staff about, um, do you put a fence on top of the trees? Do you take down the trees and put a fence instead? And those kind of level of details that typically we handle at the plant the planning commission related to like a more site plan specific detail. Um, related to the site plan itself, uh, or the site, there is um, room for five bedrooms and the uh, five extra bedrooms beyond where they live. And so they've asked to rent all five of those bedrooms for um, possible bed and breakfast overnight stays. And um, they would have um, the five parking spaces on site plus three for um, the owners uh, in the back of the yard, uh, back of the driveway, so along the driveway between the carriage house and the, the paving in the back, there's room for 
um, the parking spaces. So that's a little bit of context um, that we have in front of you. Um, as you can see by the Planning Commission, they did um, vote five to three. And so uh, immediately after that Planning Commission, we just received an appeal. And um, here's some sites, uh, pictures on context on the site. Uh, what that appeal does is basically um, kind of bring that case in front of you as a brand new case. So we re-advertise and go through the same provisions that we did at front of the Planning Commission. And with that, we did have um, three individual meetings, one with the those opposed, those with the owners, and a joint meeting uh, last Wednesday. I thought we had a um, compromise Wednesday, knowing that typically when you see conflict, you send us back to the neighborhood um, to have conversation. And so we attempted to have some dialogue on that and um, so that we could be proactive and discovered after we pu published the, um, uh, again, that was Wednesday, published the staff report on Thursday, and you know then the letters um, of still opposition continue to come in. Um, those letters of opposition do reach a 20% threshold, and I should note that um, typically you only see us talk about petitions and protests related to zoning ordinances. So this isn't a zoning ordinance, this is a conditional use permit. However, um, the staff would advise um, that you take this into consideration as a supermajority. If you chose you did not want to do that as a supermajority, um, you don't necessarily have to, but staff would recommend that as part of um, um, just due diligence and good practice related to neighboring residential conflict. And you can see in the green property owners here are the green land uses are enough to trigger the um, 20% in uh, boundary. On Thursday and Friday, Friday really talking to the city auditor, the city attorney about whether or not to recommend in support of the uh, super majority. Can I have you stop for a minute? Eric, is there anything that says we have to do super majority? Or are we just doing that at the suggestion of the planning? No, I think, uh, well, uh, we, I have had a conversation with uh, Nicole and others in the planning department about it. You know, it, uh, candidly, it is not completely clear what the LDC requires regarding um, appeals of conditional use permit requests like this. So the, the analysis is one of just evaluating what, uh, what, what an interpretation should be. And uh, although it is not completely clear, it's my opinion, it should be a, a supermajority requirement because of the protest. So are you suggesting the commission vote on that prior to doing that? Or are you suggesting? I mean, I, that is, you can accept my recommendation and, and just vote. If you want to take a motion uh, to, to adopt that as your interpretation, that's fine too, but I don't think it's necessary. Well, I just think uh, it's a, you know, sometimes these things come up and if the rules don't necessarily say you have to do it, I think you're already on the side of saying you have to do it, but I guess I'd leave it to the commission what they want to do on this particular question. I think that if you want a supermajority, we need to vote on that first. Yep. That's what I would do. You'd like a supermajority? I would like someone to, if someone, if you guys want a supermajority, I would ask that we vote on that first. Yes. Vote to have a supermajority. Are you making the motion? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. I would suggest we have the rest of the public hearing and then. Sure. Yep. Just, just so we know where we had it. Yep. Right, so I, from just to summarize, I'm hearing two motions, one to talk about if a supermajority is needed and one to actually decide the case. So uh, maybe just a little bit on um, summary um, of what we talked about. And some of these items, one through six, um, from between Planning Commission and City Commission, uh, we, did, we did add some additional conditions and that related particularly to the private parties. Uh, seemingly it's hard to codify how to have a party or how to have a reception, but um, try to do our, our best with um, the idea that, um, you know, kind of the setting of a uh, historic home like this, what would be the type of setting related to birthday shower, birthdays or um, bridal showers, baby showers, those types of things related to tea parties. And so at an attempt to try to identify what that could look like, you know, 25 attendees ceasing at 10 p.m. Um, seemingly there's not 25 parking spaces on site, and so that would overflow into the abutting streets. That is some of the conditions that, some of the concerns we're still hearing from the residents. Uh, as well as, um, is there a really adequate room to hold five parking spaces on top of the three um, homeowner parking spaces, and um, would that be a nuisance? So um, with that concerns, we are hearing some, um, some um, property owners, abutting property owners went, you know, are really holding um, true to requesting a denial. Some are okay with three instead of five overnight rentals. 
um, and so um, we have had a little bit of discussion with the applicant on if we want to make any modifications of the conditions. One of those conditions I should talk about that we came up with is um, ceasing the land use of the um, reception component upon sale or transfer of land. The bed and breakfast component would run with the land, but the cease of the party component would, um, or the component of the party would cease with land sale. So that'd be those types of level of detail. So uh, my question for you tonight would be how much you want to, um, knowing that we still have opposition, if you're ready to act, or if you want to send us back to have more discussion or see how the public hearing goes today, and staff is um, willing to um, work with you further. Well, in fairness, people probably came for the public part, so we'll let the public part go forward, and then we'll see what the commissioners would like to do. So I know when President wishes to speak to this bread and breakfast. If you want to come, you can start lining up to be after these people. Good evening, thank you for your time. Um, I am Amanda Nelson, I'm daughter to Margaret and Roger Nelson. Uh, 32 years ago, my parents purchased the house at 611, uh, originally built in 1884 by Matilda and Charles Roberts, one of the oldest houses and families in Fargo. Uh, they spent their 40s and 50s painstakingly renovating and remodeling what is now, what was then a multi-unit apartment in great dis disrepair. Repair. Um, everything was modernized and they took great care to restore the historical and architectural aspects of the Roberts house. Uh, now, after living in the home and the neighborhood for 32 years and trying to find new owners for over 15 years, uh, we are looking to expand the horizons for the beautiful house that we live in. Uh, we care a lot about the conditions and use of our home and the neighborhood. Um, and we have and will continue to live in the neighborhood that we have enjoyed for these 32 years. Thank you. Hello. My name is James Baum. I live at 511 South A Street, one house away. Actually, there's a house in between us. And my wife and I have lived in the house. Our family went to Hawthorne, went to all the local schools. They walked to school, been there for 36 years. And this would be a commercial enterprise in the middle of our block. There'd be three houses on one side, three houses on another side, and then we would have this commercial enterprise in the middle of our block. The commercial enterprise could be also summarized as a hotel. They're gonna have people stay in there, having breakfast, leaving. This house is in a national historic district with some of Fargo's finest old houses, dating back to the 1800s. Mine is in the 1800s. I believe that zoning ordinance are usually structured to preserve and enhance neighborhoods. The proposal does neither. An event center does not help make our property's value increase. The requested change is being asked for, as it was mentioned, because the house hasn't sold. The price has not been reduced drastically. I don't feel, as a neighbor, that I should even be put in this situation. I feel like a bad guy, but I don't want things to change. It's a neighborhood. Um, I don't think this, this will help our security People staying there overnight, walking up and down the neighborhood. Sure, most of the people, or 95% of the people are gonna be great guests. What do we do about the others? Thank you. My name is Roger Nelson. My wife, Margaret, and I own 611 South A Street. Um, our daughter, Amanda, referred to some of the history of the house. I won't bore you with all the details because that could take days. The house has an enormous amount of history. When we bought that house in 1987 and moved our three children, Margaret and I, into that house, it was divided into 14 living units, three on the basement, three on the first floor, three on the second floor, three on the third floor, these are all one bedrooms, and two sleeping rooms on the second floor. The house was in disrepair. 
It wasn't far from being destroyed and knocked down and turned into a multifamily housing unit like a lot of the houses in our historic area happened to them. <clears throat> we went to work on the house, gutted it, and restored the outside to as historically correct as we could based on pictures from the 1897 flood, based on fire department pictures from back, way back when they did that sort of thing. We moved brick walls back to where they should be. We moved windows back to where they should be. <clears throat> we re-windowed the house in historically correct double hung windows. We re-roofed it with historic shingles. It's a mansard roof tile house. We built a five star, five car garage in the style, sorry, in the style of the house, mansard <coughs> roof, the original brick that we salvaged from inside the house to face the garage. <clears throat> On the inside of the house, we restored as much of it as we could to original style on the first and second floors. We did add a kitchen in one of the parlors, keeping with the living ability of the house. We restored as much of the woodwork as we could, and um, the house uh, turned out, uh, if I might say so, beautiful. Uh, we did the first and second floor Victorian style in keeping with the era of the, uh, era of the house. After a million dollars, over a million dollars spent, the house is what you see now. We have opened our home to numerous people, organizations, and groups. Many of the people in this room here have attended Heritage Society meetings at our house. Uh, we have hosted uh, the FM Opera, Civic Opera, and their dinners, and the list goes on and on. We have not been selfish with the home after we did all that work on it. Matter of fact, we're quite proud of it. <clears throat> Many people over the years have expressed an interest in, gee, could we do something at your house? Some of the things that they asked about and have been mentioned here by my daughter, um, baby showers, high teas, wedding pictures, gift openings, bed and breakfast, and so forth. One of the issues that has come up in our discussions and meetings with the Planning Commission, but mostly at the uh, open house meeting we had on Wednesday, is this food situation. Now, we have mentioned Nicole's Fine Pastries, which is a real asset, I think everyone would agree if you've ever been by there, um, an asset to Fargo. And Nicole has done a marvelous job. She's a resident on A Street just down the block. Uh, if we were to host, allow uh, weddings, pic wedding showers, pictures, the things I just mentioned, the food is, we have nothing to do with the food. Nicole didn't approach us to say, hey, can you get us in here so I can sell more food or do more catering? Nicole is an option because people come to her and say, hey, do you know of any place? And she would mention our place. We have nothing to do with the food. If people want to bring their own food, they can do that. You can't do that in a hotel or most hotels. If you want to have a baby shower or a gift opening or any of the things that I've mentioned, and the list is much more extensive than I have mentioned, <clears throat> you can't bring your own food in. And so this would be, um, and we've, we've done a number of these things for Margaret's family and, uh, and um, all of the above, as a matter of fact. We made an application through the city following the code as the city has it for a bed and breakfast. The 11 criteria that you saw up here on the screen, <clears throat> we believe that we have met or will meet on some of them, uh, the screening, for example, uh, mm -hmm. all of the criteria. We have tried to do this right. We have tried to explain to anybody who was willing to talk to us about what we were gonna do, how we were gonna plan for these things. We do not have on-site parking if we happen to have an afternoon tea at the house and eight or 10 people come. We do not have off-site parking for the house for off-street parking for those kind of entities if the bed and breakfast wasn't being used at the time. We clearly have, as Nicole pointed out, and as you saw up on the screen, a parking place for each of the five bedrooms. 
four in the driveway and not even parking on the driveway where you drive in. It's four parking spots on the south side of the driveway. And four stalls available in our garage, three of which would be occupied if my daughter happened to, our daughter happened to be there, uh, and two, one car for Margaret, one car for us, and a stall for the fifth guest in the bed and breakfast. <clears throat> As I said, and I, I want to emphasize, we've tried to do this right. We've tried to apply through the city, They've been most gracious, they've taken our deals, made the application off, available for everybody. And so um, we respectively request that our proposal, and we modified the proposal for the outside events, the weddings and the parties. Calling it an event center, we believe is a great exaggeration. If I said to most of the people in this room, it's an event center, you'd think of the sanctuary, the Avalon, and those kind of things. I don't think so. We've restricted it to 25 people. I doubt that we would have that many at any one time. And I don't know how many events we'll have. We're certainly not going to have one a day. We'd be lucky to have, I think, one a month. And it's more of accommodation to people who have said, what a gorgeous home. I don't think we've had anybody walk through our house and say, what a dump. And we have restored that house. It's a landmark in Fargo. Every time our house is on an open house, a Hawthorne Homes tour, everything else, everybody comes. They sell out right away. And I'm not saying that's exclusively for us because there's a lot of other nice homes in the Hawthorne area. And so, yes, we have been trying to sell our house for 15 years. Why hasn't it sold? Nobody's been able to answer that question. I don't think it's a price issue, but that's beside the point here right now. We live there. We have lived there for 32 years. We've done everything we possibly could to make that place a showcase for the city of Fargo. We are not that far from downtown, so if you want to go down to Ramos Boys Pizza, you can walk downtown. Our neighbors behind us moved onto 9th Street exclusively for the distance between their house on 9th Street right behind us and downtown. So that's our story and we're sticking to it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Nope. Anybody else want to speak? Good evening, commissioners, mayor. My name is Scott Neal. I live at 623 8th Street South. I'm the neighbor to the south. Um, this really isn't about the uh, applicant. The Nelsons are wonderful neighbors and <coughs> have nothing but good things to say about them. And I also have good things to say about your um, uh, planning department. Uh, Kylie's been very respectful to all of us on both sides of the issue and uh, has been wonderful in getting us together on a couple occasions. So uh, as smooth as it could possibly get, I think we're there. But having said that, um, you know, everything the applicant said and others said is, is about our home. We've restored our home. We've, this is our home and this and that. We live at our home. And, but the application isn't consistent with that. It's a bed and breakfast. I call it a hotel, an event center, but you call it a bed and breakfast, whatever. That's not a home anymore, it's a commercial enterprise. And so with the commercial enterprise, money's involved, employees are involved, uh, strangers are, in this particular case are coming and going. Even if you allow up to five rooms that are, that are rented out, that's up to 10 people, say a, a night, that's up to 300 people coming and going on a monthly basis and an exponential number on a, on a uh, yearly basis. Uh, right now, we live in a neighborhood. You go up and down 8th Street, every single home on both sides, across the street, everything else is residential. It doesn't have that kind of traffic. It's, even in, in a multifamily unit, it's rented out on a, on a six-month or a year lease, or whatever it is, but we don't have people coming and going on a daily basis. That street's heavily trafficked. As you know, it's a snow emergency route. There's not adequate parking for this commercial enterprise, and certainly not in an event center. During the winter time, as the snow emergency route from November to May, or April, I believe, uh, half the street's blocked off. You're not allowed to park on, on the, on the, on the uh, west side of the street. So I don't know how you're going to accommodate that. Uh, last year, if you try to drive up and down 8th Street, it was a disaster. So, um, so I think at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself a simple question. You all have homes, right? Would you want a bed and breakfast, a hotel, and an event center sitting next to you that could allow up to 25 people on any particular night serving commercial business. Ask yourself that question and now you see why I'm hoping you deny it. Thank you. 
So anybody else wish to speak? We'll close public hearing. What the commission would like to do? Well, Mr. Chairman, I am. Um, we're discussing whether we should vote on the two thirds or not. I whispered that it should be three options, and one of those could be tabling of uh, this decision. And and so I'm, I'm evaluating what the sentiment here is tonight. Um, earlier today, I did talk to Mr. Johnson, and I've had conversations with Nicole on this. Um, trying to understand the difference between an Airbnb, which is a popular um, tool, if you will, to, for people to use around the country, around the world, um, to find residents, and distinguish the difference between using Airbnb as an approach versus following the process and asking for this request. And Eric, maybe I could ask you to you know, elaborate a little bit, but it's just, it, I think that's fundamental um, you know, for me, understanding that more clear. And as a side note, as we start our land development code revisions and our core neighborhood plan um, and the whole notion of Airbnb and what does that mean for this community um, is, is something we need to be thinking about. And so um, maybe Eric, you could kind of share uh, the current ordinance that we have so that it's clear that Airbnb has to follow these rules as well, if I understood sure. you correctly. Yeah. Absolutely, yep. So Airbnb being air bed and breakfast uh, is, is uh, really just a, in a way, uh, just an internet marketing mechanism for people to uh, make their homes available for a bed and breakfast. So it's simply no different than the application we have in front of us, where if you live in a residential zoning district and you want and you and you live there as your home, uh, and you want to have guests that pay you to to stay there and sleep overnight and have breakfast in the morning. That's the definition of a bed and breakfast. What, whether you're using the internet or not to market your mechanism. It's still a bed and breakfast. It requires a conditional use permit, which is exactly what you're hearing here. So it's it's identical. Uh, so, well, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission, then for just to add a further, um, as has been shared here this evening, um, there's been added information and uh, additional ideas for compromise that actually came in today in our emails. And so, uh, you know, I'm of the opinion that if there is a room, if there is room for compromise, that it not be solved here tonight. We delay this. And if there's not a resolve on compromise, then we act accordingly in two weeks and vote it up or down. And we could clearly take the motion tonight to clarify that it will require, you know, um, four votes. But I, I don't know how everybody else feels. Um, so is your motion to table? I, I'm not going to make any motion yet because okay. I want to know the sentiment of the trend. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I lived on that block when this became the new changed ownership. Uh, I was a resident from 1980. I, I was on 700 South 9th Street and moved away in 88 and owned it till 95. And I remember when that house changed ownership and went from that dilapidated apartment building that wasn't good for the neighborhood. And the options weren't very good then for what would happen to the, this historic home. This is the Roberts house. That's the Roberts addition. I mean, it, there hardly are any more historic homes in all of Fargo than the Roberts house in the Roberts edition. And, and when it was a, a dozen or more apartments, it wasn't pretty. You know, so gosh darn, I, I would have celebrated back then as a neighbor who was a real active member in the Heritage Society and in our historic overlay and all of those activities. I would have, I would have celebrated the op option to see that house have new life breathed into it for a new future for new generations of people to come and get exposed to this unbelievably terrific history. So I'm all in favor of this. I, I can understand neighbors who might not want uh, 15 or 20 people nearby, but <clears throat> back before the party patrol, I used to have a Halloween party <laughs> at 700 South 9th Street. I remember two, 300 people there one night. It was the biggest party in town. And the neighbors were all there. So, so we all have lives where we bring people to our places and our homes. I'm, I'm, for the sake of the discussion, I move approval of the conditional permit. Is there a second? Is there a second? Hearing no second, do I have another motion? I'll make one of two motions. First is uh, clarify that um, my intent is to make a second motion to delay for two weeks to see if there is room for compromise. The first motion would clarify that we require four votes based on the protest. So I'd move that first. Asking you for four votes. Yes. Okay. You move it as four votes. Is there a second? Second. 
Mr. Strand. Does that require a simple majority or a super majority? <laughs> I, I just can't imagine voting on what type of majority is required for a policy. Yeah, well, I think uh, I, my opinion is uh, that uh, when it comes to making interpretations of city ordinance, actually the city commission can, can adopt interpretations and uh, I view that's what your motion is is to adopt the interpretation that 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 the ordinance that talks about zoning map amendments the rezoning ordinance that normally have that that would also apply to a conditional use permit such as this that's appealed to the City Commission that's that's really what your motion is is that uh, it's an inter that's the interpretation you want to adopt uh, Mr. Gary, for your ordinances. And with that knowledge, I mean, <clears throat> that's why I would caution us to not have a supermajority in this situation because it extends past this particular situation. So I'm going to vote against it for that simple point. I don't think it's a bad idea in this particular case, but I think it has larger implications than this particular point. Just for what we're making in the future because of this. It's okay. Mr. Pepperin? Got nothing. Any other comments? Roll call vote, please. Grinberg? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Strand? No. Gary? No. Mahoney. Oh. Third item. Move we table for two weeks. Fair and second. The parties come together and um, see if there's room for compromise. Fair second. I'll second it for discussion. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Can you discuss a table motion? I don't think you can. Can you? Non debate no. motion. No discussion. You know, there's no discussion. Roll call vote. Motion. Sorry, John. You're right. Um, well, then I'll pull mine. I didn't know that. <laughs> You withdraw a second. Do I have any motions? Here's, here's the reason why. Um, is there room for compromise? I don't know the backstory as well as maybe Tony Greenberg does. Is there a way that this is going to be resolved in the next two weeks? I highly doubt that to be the case from what I've heard. Well, I don't know about the parties, but I know the one email I had today was somebody who was concerned and said it you know, made the point about three versus five. Um, and so I don't know what the parties if they've even aware of that. Uh, the point being is for us to try and compromise something here because of information is not fair to the process. And so if there is, then give them two weeks and if not, vote, it, vote your conscience, vote up or down in two weeks. I, I'm just trying to figure out where the middle ground is here based on what happened last Wednesday, what came in Friday, and now Monday night. And I don't know if it's appropriate for a staff comment here or not. Um, I don't know if you would want to, typically at a planning commission, they would ask the applicant if they would be open to uh, a two week continuation. Um, just just saying how the planning commission does it. I'll ask that. Are you a willing to do a two week? Do you think it would help? Ah, sure. Now will you second that? <laughs> second. Second by Scripture Strand. Roll call vote. Grinberg? Aye. Strand? Yes. Gary? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Item 37. I don't know if we should take a break or we should get into this next. Referral uh, final recommendations from the Special Assessment Task Force to city staff to evaluate, incorporate, revise draft infrastructure funding policy. We do have public comment on the budget here in a little bit, but I, I thought we should probably get through this stuff first. Uh, are there some people that want to speak to the budget? If not, we'll go to 37. Commissioner Grinberg. Mr. Chairman, I'm looking for my papers here, if you'll bear with me a second. In essence, what we have before us tonight is a recommendation to move the task force recommendations completed on August 6th to city staff to review existing infrastructure policy and make recommendations that pattern the um, series of meetings the task force had that appropriate city staff were in attendance as well as the written report um, to bring back to us for our deliberations for a final action of a policy that, as I understand, would all likelihood go into effect in 2020. Um, some of that um, is determined based on what people have heard, and we've talked briefly here about the Prairie Dog funding as a key um, game changer for our infrastructure policy and our funding policies. Um, so with the, the 
memo here and the recommendations, I'll just um, run through those. I think they're worth bringing out um, to those in the audience in particular that haven't followed this. And I'll try and do this in an expeditious timeline. Um, really put into you know three categories, <coughs> five categories rather from the uh, task force. Uh, one is long-term planning, um, create long-term CIP uh, capital improvement plan with project level details and publish on websites, um, send letters to citizens so there's transparency and public awareness of the city's five-year plan, uh, adopt CIP policy, it locks down projects um, based on budgets and timing as our work goes on here at the city commission level. Under communications, uh, expand data on notice to provide total estimated project costs. Um, this idea would bring full transparency to all the sources of funds that are used to pay for infrastructure, um, not just city and um, um, sales tax, but full, full, the property taxpayer would understand the whole gamut. Um, discussion with um, involving the commercial realtor association on notices, creating uh, direct project link to map and assessment notice data, expand and update functionality of the special assessment website, show net assessment at parcel level and the certified amounts and monthly payments to the certified amounts in, in, under the communications umbrella or bucket rather, reference and promote state homestead tax credit for special assessments and the city special assessment policy and communi communication with taxpayers so they're aware of relief for low income individuals, hire communications consulting firm to review the current communications plan for special assessments and develop alternatives. Under financial management, pass on the lower interest rate to property owners when bonds are refinanced. Uh, to uh, modify current bond interest held on policy markup and margins, uh, various percentage and drop the percentages. 13, um, stop certifying and collecting special assessments when the debt service of the fund has enough cash to reserve to retire obligations and then uh, refund um, those property owners accordingly, adopt revolving loan funds, modify current assessment practices for arterial roadways to lower assessment levels. Um, that's one of the uh, underlying principles we heard at both public forums where residents showed up was a concern over impact of arterials. Uh, eliminating use of special assessments for infrastructure components, assessment on projects with construction as far as streets, sanitary sewer, water, stormwater, sidewalks, and flood control for green fields, and eliminate to that that the city's role is in that area, not uh, non-critical infrastructure. Uh, of course, the Prairie Dog funds, how we're gonna make decisions to um, implement Prairie Dog to offset costs and reduce the burden on taxpayers. Discontinue the current practice of LOMAR. Uh, index um, uh, for projects, uh, their index in with inflation. And then I will not go through the rest of the various options that were submitted on uh, modifying the existing policy, but you have that in front of you um, to move forward. So uh, it's um, my belief um, that we should um, now direct this to city staff to come back to us, factor in your discussions and desires here as commissioners and as mayor, and then come back and adopt a policy this fall. So I would move that recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second it. For the discussion, Commissioner Garrett. The reason that this task force was put together was because during the election cycle, there was a massive outpouring of uh, disdain for special assessments based mostly around the Broadway project and then people learning more and more about the process. The people of Fargo were very clear in asking us to dramatically reduce special assessments or to rid them of special assessments. These suggestions do, do neither of those things. Um, we, we cannot sit here and, and, and say that a reduction of a quarter of a percent on existing infrastructure's interest payments is a big move to help residents. We cannot say that limiting uh, the fee that we charge for engineering at 211% is a big win for the residents. That's still a lot of money. These are very minor changes um, that will still allow a system that if you do not pay your special assessments, if you don't pay the fees and the interest, we can take, and we have to, by law, take your home. Uh, that is not a good system for the residents of Fargo. The good news is we know, we know what to do. Prairie Dog funds to the tune of 13 plus million dollars are coming to the city next year. Uh, our average amount that we have special assessed for the last five years is 13 million dollars. Uh, we need to make an ordinance in the city of Fargo saying that as long as the Prairie Dog funding is available, 100, every penny of, the, of, the, of that amount needs to go to offset the cost of specials. Every penny needs to go to specials, but we would charge the pass for specials, needs to go to that first. Then, if there's anything left over, which there probably won't be, we need to use the half cent infrastructure sales tax that we've already levied on the people of Fargo to pay for infrastructure. Not pay for the water plant that's done. The water plant's done. 
Okay, we use that infrastructure half cent sales tax, quarter cent sales tax, to go to the water plant. We don't need to be doing that. It's it's a it's a way to funnel money from sales tax to the general fund. It's it's money laundering is what it is. So we should not insult the people of Fargo by pushing these um, suggestions forward. And I want to point something important out. The last election season was shaped by this discussion. Next year is an election. So I want every commissioner and every mayor and everybody else who is for special assessments to point that out next time they run for commissioner. Mr. Chairman, sure, sure. Quick, just a couple things. So special assessments, uh, you can change the name of it. It's a bill. We have to pay the bill. So uh, how, what we debate about all this, and to use money laundering, that's embarrassing. Uh, I just think that's ridiculous. Uh, but we have, to, we have to pay for these things. And to use the, the Prairie Dog Fund and then to act like that's some kind of permanent solution, that's a one-time thing. We, it perhaps could happen in the future, it perhaps couldn't. So for us to say, we're just gonna use that and rely on that for, for and, and this is how we fund our neighborhood infrastructure. That, that's what it is. And so I, I think we have to be very careful. I fully support, I think there's a lot of things we can do to improve the system without a doubt. And so I look forward to that. Uh, there's lots of things. I think we have a very good system. It's very unique, but I, I think it's very good. And the one thing I, so I try to keep things simple. I'm not that bright. But what we do is uh, the city does the infrastructure. In most cities, that's not what they do. But the cool thing about that is 40 or 50 years from now, the infrastructure is on us, on the city. The developers are long gone. And so by us controlling the quality of the infrastructure, that's a good thing because down the road, we are the ones that are going to be held accountable for it. Anyway, all right, that's the end of my comments. Thank you. Greenberg. Well, I would just add that, you know, a underlying premise for when we started this task force, which is um, in North Dakota Century Code, is um, defining the benefit. And, you know, early on in the task force, um, it also, we also agreed, they, the task force agreed to uh, view uh, Greenfield Special Assessment as one side of the ledger, and reconstruction, which is largely where our policy has been you know, amended last year to 70-30 from 50-50 is on reconstruction. And so even tonight on the consent agenda, um, from a Greenfields perspective, it's often, in my opinion, philosophical whether the city should be in the financing of special assessments for new development. Well, tonight on the consent agenda, we approved a developer to do their own infrastructure, and they'll add that to the cost of the lot. And so if it's, I'm running my own simple numbers, if it's a $60,000 lot, um, it's gonna be 40 to $50,000 in specials, guess what the lot price is? So, you know, the task force took the notion that city's a good partner for green fields, and if you buy a new home, build a new home, you assume the responsibility for those specials, and that's your benefit. You get that infrastructure, and you're paying for that, whether you live in the home 25 or 30 years, or a portion of it for seven years. The, um, I think the debate in our community, as Commissioner Gehrig has alluded to, at least it's my opinion, that if you're going to eliminate specials, then what about, is it deconstruction, or are you going to try and cast this wand of the whole bucket with Greenfields? Because if, if I'm a taxpayer and I have my specials paid off, and you're going to tax me and raise my utility rates to pay somebody else's specials that they benefit from, that's just not right. And that's not going to fly in the eye of the beholder. So whether or not there's election consequences, you know, We've all been around, you make your own decision on election consequences. The responsible thing to do is to work with the task force recommendations and minimize the impact, particularly on the right side of the ledger where reconstruction prevails. And the North Broadway example with Mr. Worth, who's now passed on with a member of the task force, that had real substantial cost consequences to the taxpayers. That 70-30 shift um, brought that down to a minimal, if you recall from the public forums, uh, with using Prairie Dog, you know, a reconstruction on average cost was somewhere around six or eight thousand dollars of a property taxpayer's portion for 25 years. Pretty reasonable compared to the way the old policy was. And so it's incumbent on us and staff to look at the vision of the city, the long term needs of the city, and the capital needs, use the Prairie Dog funds, and what other tools are available to come back to us and say, this is sound, this will have real meaningful tax consequences on the reconstruct reconstruction side of the ledger. And I firmly believe that. I think it's disingenuous to say this is a shell game. 
uh, because this will have real meaning and real tax relief based on this state addition of funds, as well as being prudent on our own resources, whether the present utility funds and a portion for specials, if that's a decision that's made here this fall. Commissioner Gert. The shell game, let's start there. The water plant, for example, this is all legal, by the way, receives, what, $7 million per year, give or take, in sales tax. They utilize about two. And then the rest of it goes where? It gets transferred to the general fund, an intergovernmental transfer. That's legal. They're taking the, ta the sales tax dollars that we thought was for infrastructure and putting it in the general fund. What do we do in the general fund? Everything, not just infrastructure. That is the, the definition of a shell game. So to say it's disingenuous is not looking at the facts. <clears> Two, <throat> we're taking in $13 million of brand new money this year from the state for infrastructure. And it's as permanent as state law is. It's a state law that money will keep coming in. It's not a one-time deal. Construction quality of infrastructure. City employees do not go out and build a road. Whether it's a new road or an old road, we have contractors that do that. The general contractor gets them to do that and the inspections department, which we just saw a nice video about, goes and sees if they did it right. If they don't, they redo it. So us having control over infrastructure with special assessments is nonsensical. That person who's doing it without specials who has the exact same standards as if you use specials. You may not have specials today, and you may have paid them off. You will at some point again. They are reoccurring. You can pay them off every year. Every time you get one, you can pay it off. You will get one again if you live long enough. <laughs> if you're lucky enough to live long enough, you will get another one, okay? So by having a start and an end date to a bad process doesn't mean you're screwing over the next guy. It means that that was the system then. Now we found $13 million that we didn't have before, and we're putting that to good use to end a bad system that is universally hated by our residents. I would love for you guys to show me as many people have, show, have talked to me, emailed me, called me about how they hate specials and have the same number of people come up and say, I love specials. I love getting that letter in the mail. That'd be hard to find. We need to listen to the people of Fargo and rid us of the system. Commissioner Strand. Thank you, Mayor. I'm, <clears throat> you know, we all know that this topic has been being vetted for some time, months, in fact. What I didn't know is how it would come back to us and how we would receive it and, and act from that point going forward. I, I'm not ready to vote on any of this tonight. I'm, I'm, I, I, I would like to have us have a, a good, deep discussion about many, many elements of this proposal your committee has, has worked on, Commissioner Grinberg, um, but I'm not ready to vote on it. I have, I have questions, pages of questions, and I know people out there who have pages of questions, and there's some really good insight in there, there's some good direction, but I don't think we've landed on the change where we need to land yet. And I'd hate to see us just vote it down tonight because people like me aren't, aren't, aren't ready to vote yes yet, uh, and, and I'm not ready to vote yes. I, I, some of my questions about greenfields, I want to study the greenfields versus you know developments and who funds it deeply and, and look at benchmarks and models and what other people do. And I want to know the consequences to us financially and as far as quality goes. I'm not ready to vote for that yet right now. I'm, I'm not I'm also have concerns about greenfield de developments, developers securities. I don't know if you discussed it or not, but uh, some of our policies require a developer to have a letter of credit. What good's a letter of credit if they go south and th sink? I want to have an, an, an analysis of what is type, what type of security is appropriate. I know in Moorhead there's a developer that went went under. Uh, my sister in Mo Mandan, they, she's in a, a development that the developer left town and went under, and and so there's consequences to that. I, I'd like to analyze that more before before I'm ready to vote on that. I don't know if your committee addressed deferrals. There's millions of dollars of deferrals on the books. I thought that was, I was hoping that's one of our topics. How do we address deferrals? What are our options in going forward for deferrals? The, you know, the farmland that doesn't get developed for 10 years or the, or the uh, horse park or the airport. There's, all, there's just, those are just loose examples of deferrals. We have examples in town where zoning can affect uh, uh, specials. If you have a, like on South 4th Street, there was a home there that had a mother-in-law suite. Well, all of a sudden, it categorically put them into an entirely different grouping for their specials. And, and that was one of the ones that got our attention. But so there's some of those nuances I, I, I'd like to see us um, look into and study. 
And then I have some questions about some of these aspects of legality. I've, I've had people pose questions to me, is what you do this way perfectly legal? And before I vote on those things, I'd like to know my questions and their questions are answered. So my suggestion to our commission is, uh, let's take this baton you're passing to us, Commissioner Grinberg. And I'll say one more thing. I, I didn't have anybody on your committee. I advanced two names, and neither, neither was accepted. So I didn't have a voice there. So you're stuck with me now, uh, <laughs> after the fact. Um, and, and I wanted to have people on the committee who had dissenting views and contrarian approaches to things so that their questions were vetted and that we're still not answering them later on in life, uh, which we will be, I assure you. So what I would suggest is we go to uh, something akin to a, a, a brown bag, uh, where we can, and maybe a few of them, where we can segment these topics out and have a discussion about them. So I can hear from your committee what their thinking was, why, I can learn more about our history, and then we can resolve each little part at a time, and then our commission can come up with a, a, a new proposal, maybe. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Strand, I can assure you there was dissent and, and opposing views throughout the process of the task force. Um, and I don't think there's anything in the motion and the intent behind this to move forward that prohibits anything you said to happen. All this is saying is somebody has to take the ball at this point and move forward with this list of recommendations and start to go to work on it that would involve each one of us individually. It could involve a round table, a brown bag, you name it. But we have to keep this moving to get to an end game where we're going to have a, a decision here. And so to me, it all sinks to what the intent behind the emotion is to what you just conveyed to, the, to us this evening, John. Um, the, this isn't saying this is the new plan. It's just saying staff go to work on this, come back periodically and give us updates on how this is going to fit and what are the ramifications. And it doesn't mean you can't add more things to it. We're the elected officials. This is a task force set of recommendations. You can add and amend how this thing moves forward, how you see fit. The committee has met for well over a year almost, John, at this point. Uh, for instance, if you drop a percentage from engineering and a percentage from administration, that drops off 700000 off the general fund. How are you going to make up for that? Those are the questions you're asking, and that has to be deliberated. Uh, what he's asking is, this is a list to look at. There's no question you could ask for anything else to me, because it just says, here, staff, let's look at the net consequences. I don't believe they could have got a consensus out of the committee of these are the four recommendations and that's the difficulty in that committee is they just, there is a variance of opinion in that committee. It's time to act and so I think what both commissioners want is let's get it to the hands of our staff, let's drag up some, some options and we can vote it up or down as a commission. But right now it's, it's to, to many of the two commissioners here is the public would like to see some action. So, Commissioner Eric. That's the problem. When we first started this, this committee, I asked the, the task force to give us options. Give us three options at a minimum. One, do nothing, which is basically what this is. Two, reduce uh, special assessments dramatically. Or three, rid them. Then we explore what that means. That's what this task force was meant to do. Now we get this list of things that maybe you agree with most of them, maybe you don't agree with most of them, maybe you don't know. But now we're, we're telling staff then to carry that ball forward and move forward behind the, you know, the eye of the public, because they don't work you know, in, in, a, in a bubble. They go to their office and they work. I, I don't want them to do that with this recommendation, because I don't agree with this. So this, is, this does have ramifications. I would rather have three options that then we could have discussed and said, OK, now staff, take these three. Tell us what this means for the city of Fargo. With your taxes, with your property taxes, with your sales taxes, with all the other things, how would it affect that using these three things? But garbage in, garbage out. If we give them this list of things that don't really do anything, you're going to get a bad result, which I don't want to have, to have happen. Mr. Chairman, just a couple of things. Okay. So let me just re read the motion again to refer the attached City of Fargo Special Assessment Task Force summar Summary to final recommendations to staff to be evaluated and incorporated into revised draft infrastructure funding policy. So it's, they're going to come forward with some recommendations. The other thing I find a little bit ironic is uh, in the attendance for the Special Assessment Task Force, Commissioner Gehrig wasn't even there. So if hey, you Where so, was I? Where was I? I, I have no Deployed idea. Deployed for the military. Well, I'm just saying. Sorry, Dave. Sorry about that. No, I'm just, it's just ironic that you seem to be uh, very upset about it, but then you're not at the meetings. Any other discussion? Otherwise, we'll go to roll call vote. Roll call vote, please. 
Excuse me, Mayor. I'm, I'd, I'd like to chime in a little more. Help us understand what's changing. Uh, the biggest change in specials was when we, as a commission, mid-election cycle, addressed the 70-30 percentage split versus 50-50. That's the biggest change that's happened in the last few years. I'd, these other, there's hardly anything here that's consequential. Nothing consequential. I, I just don't know what we're changing or what you're recommending. There's some good policy analysis in here and, 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 and aspects to study and look at here, but I don't see any change here except for the percentage. You've raised the percentage for commercial properties and lowered it, the overall 1% to one to 73 quarters of a percent to up to 1.5% for commercial versus, you know, that's the only change I see in here. Well, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Strand, it goes back to the premise of the purpose on the front end was to educate the task force. This is not an easy subject. And as, as much as Commissioner Gehrig would like to make it an easy subject, it's not. This whole thing is embedded in benefit. And over the course of time, the city of Fargo has made conscious decisions. The voters in the past have made decisions to increase sales tax to modernize the infrastructure of the city, which is, which is largely the reconstruction side of the ledger, as I noted earlier. The benefit side on the left side of the ledger is new greenfields. We can have the debate um, whether you um, allow the developer to do it and go to hire an engineering firm to build in fees and add into the cost of the lot, or do it like the Home Builders Association prefers, that it's a level playing field for people to compete. We can have that debate. The fundamental game change here is understanding you know, what it is we're, we're about, and somebody has to pay. Somebody has to pay. And the fact that this thing draw, drug out longer than we probably would have liked was part of the legislative session. Um, and to say that these are, there's window dressing around it, I'll admit that, drop a fee here, doesn't, to Commissioner Gehrig's point, doesn't make a lot of fundamental change. But bringing in state funds for the first time to complement local funds and modernize our infrastructure and reduce the impact on taxpayers is gonna be substantial. If, if you don't believe that, then spend an hour with engineering or assessments. It's real. To say that it's not is, is a misnomer in my opinion. But the greenfield side is gonna, there isn't gonna be much change on the greenfield side because it's, it, it is what it is as far as a new greenfield development. And you, 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 as a property owner, you're gonna pay for that benefit. We subsidize reconstruction. And now the state's gonna help us subsidize that. I don't know how many other ways to explain that. Commissioner Strand, just uh, public hearings were held. Probably the two biggest items were reconstruction and specials and uh, arterials were two of the biggest items. Uh, staff has looked at this, you got 13 million. Okay, let's say we have 13 million. Commissioner Garrick has a way of applying that. But let's say it's 13 million and they have a certain amount of uh, reconstruction done this year, do you have a different amount next year? Are you gonna variably put that in there? So if you have 30 or 40 million, you're gonna get 5%, and the next year when you don't have many is you're gonna get, get, get 10%. So part of the issue you have to show to staff is, okay, looking at what we've done in our C, uh, CIP for this year, next year, what are the consequences and what are they on a predictable, fair fashion? And that's the way I think that this committee can't do that. It's actually our engineers have to go out and get exactly what you want. What is the impact? And to the real point is, what is the impact for the individual taxpayer? That's what we want to discern. And then as a commission, we can say, yes, this is how we'd like it applied, or no, we don't. And our engineering staff, in, you know, in defense of them, it's not just a simple thing, because it's exactly what we talked about. How do you get the benefit? Who gets the benefit? How much of the benefit? And uh, we learned a big lesson in Broadway when that was applied and whoops, that was a primary sector and it was an arterial at the same time. It really popped them way up there and we got it back on the 70-30. So the only way you, in some ways in which you can get a, a something which you can objectively vote on, is what are the consequences of this policy change? That's what you're asking the engineering team to come up with. What are the consequences of this action? Then as a commission, we can vote on it knowing the consequences. Commissioner Garrick has an idea. We apply that, see what that's gonna do. Are we gonna increase utility rates? Are we gonna take funding away from utilities? What are we gonna do? Everyone has a consequence with this commission should be fully informed on and then make their choices. Commissioner Strand. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioner Grinberg. I'll address two points. The Prairie Dog Fund, you know, we have it for this legislative cycle. We have no guarantee of it into the future. 
I remember when they reduced mills, 17 or 18 mills, for two cycles, and then they pulled it away. We have no assurance whatsoever from Bismarck and the legislature that they will give this, this pass this last session. So we have to be realistic about that. There's no, there, you, you, you count your chickens when they hatch, not pre previously. So I have no guarantee the prairie dog funds are there. If we have prairie dog funds, then I would say use them for the greater public good. Don't use them for particular projects that just affect some individuals. Go to the projects that are for the greatest good, for the greatest benefit of the greatest public. You know, so there's a discussion there. Where do, the, if and how long we have specials or, or prairie dog funds, where do we apply them? I'd say put them to where they get to the be most benefit to the biggest number of people. Okay, let's talk green fields. I'm not an expert at green fields and developers and specials and assessments and all that, but I do know this. We have approaching, as I, I think I know this, Kent you, Koskin, you can maybe tell me if I'm wrong, we have approaching a half a billion dollars in debt, That's correct. bonded indebtedness for specials, for green fields, mostly. What happens if 2008 happens again and we have a crash in our economy? What are the unintended consequences of that? Who's going to pay that bill? What's going to happen to that house over there that's sitting there in a new development that has tens of thousands of assessments on, against it and then the market plummets and they can't get their value out of it and they go south and they're underwater? What's the, cons into, un, 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 uh, what's the in, implication to the city? Who's going to pay that half a billion dollars in debt? I'm worried about that. I would rather have us go down a path or know if we can go down a path where the public isn't on the hook for, that, for those millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I would like to weigh the, the differences of, of those approaches. In my, I'm not satisfied yet that it's our job to fund those Greenfields developments. I think that's a discussion to have. Roll call vote. Grinberg? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Strand? No. Gary? No. Mahoney? Aye. State Water Commission requests for cost reimbursement of the FM diversion flood project costs the amount of 2835957.03. Ken Costin, please. Yes, Commissioners, this is a request for a reimbursement to the State Water Commission uh, for the month of July. $5.5 million was expended and we expect to recover $2.835 million. And all of these costs were for uh, either land uh, acquisitions for the diversion project, which were substantial in the case of this one. There was about $3.3 million worth of land acquisitions. That whole process is starting to ramp up because of the uh, movement on the diversion. And then the other uh, part of that $2.2 million was for the Second Street and Main Avenue project that's currently underway. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Greenberg? Aye. Gary? Pepcorn? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Update on the 2019 stormwater discharge and treatment policy. Jody Bertrand to explain. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, I guess, Mayor and Commission members. Uh, came here tonight to go ahead and kind of briefly cover our stormwater discharge and treatment policy. It, uh, totally different topic than the stormwater fee that we implemented at the beginning of this year. What this document is, is uh, it's the updated guidance for the design for the developments of new areas and uh, site plans throughout the city. So what it is, is it's the working document that the engineers use to go ahead and uh, make the design changes or design decisions while they're uh, making site plan uh, created. So uh, first thing, the existing policy that we're presently using was created in 2001. Uh, very small parcels of one acre are exempt from the retention requirements. And the existing policy pretty much has the volumes and release rates they were created under a uh, very simplistic formula versus uh, the standard that we use today for most of our design engineering is a, a modeling method to show where the uh, watering is, the flow path, and the impacts to specific sites. Jody, can I just stop you for a minute? Yep. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll take a five minute recess. Then I didn't realize you had this long presentation, but let's take a five minute recess and then I'll have you continue where you started. I call the meeting back to order. And Jody, I'm gonna do a little switch on you. There's a lot of people here that have been waiting to comment on the preliminary 2020 preliminary budget and recommended tax levy. So I'm gonna to jump to that first and then I'll come back to you.
Is there anyone present here uh, who would like to speak about the 2020 preliminary budget and recommended tax levies? Is there anybody here who would like to give some of the advice to the commission and the mayor? <coughs> Is there anyone present here who wants to give uh, any comments on the budget's mayor, mayor's budget? Can't you add somebody or? <laughs> okay, well, I'll go to Jody's <laughs> presentation. Uh, Tony, you saw this at utilities. Was there anybody concerned about the water discharge treatment policy? Are you guys okay with it, or have you seen it, John? It was not utility. Okay, that's fine. Okay. As I was kind of mentioning before the break, uh, this uh, document we've been putting together, we've been working on it for about a year and a half. We're on revision number nine, what we've kind of put before you today. Uh, we did go ahead and out and uh, do some outreach with our local consultants to do our site plans. And we gathered uh, some of their concerns and issues. And as part of this present policy that we have before you, it has incorporated uh, many of those. Uh, a couple of them related to some parking lots, how you handle those, and also some really small lots and the uh, requirements you have for the release rates. So the next is some of the policy changes that we actually are trying to incorporate for this round is we're actually combining multiple documents. We're trying to take uh, some of the ordinance language along with the existing design requirements we have out there uh, incorporate new water quality treatment, uh, which kind of has twofold. First, it's the state requirements, and then also some of the uh, devices we use for water quality. So we've actually got uh, specific language in there, what they have to uh, remove for suspended solids, and then we've taken the city pond requirements, which working through Ben and his folks that have to maintain those on a yearly basis, what they'd kind of like to see out there for uh, stability concerns. Uh, a couple of the other policy changes, we're actually moving towards uh, total modeling. So each site is going to be modeled to go have the impacts, flow parameters, and pretty much the time of concentration identified to go ahead and determine what the impact is on the overall storm sewer system. So as I mentioned, specific parking lots, there will be some improvements that are going to have to be made. And uh, they might have to put in some additional storm sewer versus uh, sheet draining, which they used to do on many of the uh, lots around town. Uh, the other major highlights for the existing proposed policy is we're going to, all the release rates are going to be uh, controlled by one CFS. So that's going to be uh, based on the size of your parcel. That's how much you can send to the existing storm sewer system. And then we've, uh, like I said, we kind of talked on the water quality devices and the pond requirements are all included in this document versus trying to find them in four separate locations. So that was kind of our work that we've done over the last year and a half to get this policy and uh, put everything together so that we have uh, a good document that the uh, consultants understand and we have uh, no pushback, I guess. Everything is kind of uh, laid out the way that uh, they think it should be along with meeting all of the requirements that we think we need to meet. Uh, there is one topic that I'd like to kind of touch before we ask for approval of the policy is that through our uh, investigation over the last year and a half, uh, one major topic kind of came up. It was the DMU zoning. And where that comes into play is a lot of the uh, downtown mixed use properties build to the property line. So that and it does not enable us to have any stormwater ponding uh, locations to go ahead and uh, give some relief to the storm sewer system. So I guess what we're looking to do in future proposals is if they're looking to expand the DMU past the existing limits that we possibly be able to go ahead and uh, not grant the exemption to the stormwater retention. Uh, presently, anything that comes in with DMU, it makes the site plan very easy because we don't have to look for any stormwater, but it doesn't help out the situation with the uh, stormwater uh, system as a whole, I guess, to go ahead and prevent damage. So I, that being said, unless we have other specific questions, I guess I have a recommended motion to approve the new 2019 policy for the stormwater discharge and treatment. Mr. Strand has a question. Thank you. I'm just curious. <clears throat> do we have any allowances for porous surfaces, porous parking lots, porous driveways, porous surfaces that we're hearing around the country? Uh, most, are... every, most everything we've kind of come to are the training that I went to. Uh, the porous pavements don't aren't effective around here. The things you really need to do the 
the ice and flowing and the sand that we put in to go ahead and decrease the, the ice buildup that actually fills in all the pores and then you need pretty much a big vacuum truck to suck all the sand out to be able to make it function as it should along with having the clay soils underneath as not you know the sandy soils would be the preferable. So they're not viable around here yet at this point? Yeah, very few people would find those as a viable solution. Well, John, we've seen great examples in some cities how they do that. It's just amazing our soil is just too much clay, hey? Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Good work. I'm glad you worked with everybody on this. Appreciate it. Roll call vote. Epcorn. Aye. Garrick. Yes. Grinberg. Aye. Strand. Yes. Mahoney. Aye. I need to do one other item is that we had a public hearing, which we didn't have any public plate to us, but we need to close that public hearing. But can I have a motion to close the public so, hearing? Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Grinberg. Gary. Yes. Pepcorn. Aye. Strand. Yes. Mahoney. Yeah, it's aye. Very good. Aye. Will you have a motion to adjourn? It's a move. Is there a second? second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> Spirited discussions are good, but they last a long time. <laughs>